Well, thank you very much, Jahi. Thank you very much, Juliet. Appreciate that. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, however terrible the circumstances. And many of you, as many of you already know, industrial turkey and chicken in Minnesota and other states, Midwest and South, have been hit by a highly pathogenic strain of avian influenza H5N2. Millions of birds have been killed by the virus or culled in an effort to control the outbreak. The epizootic began out in the Northwest with H5N2 hitting a number of backyard farms and wild birds in December before spreading east. Suddenly, in early March, H5N2 wiped out 15,000 turkeys on an industrial farm in Pope County, the first of what would be nearly 9 million birds and counting killed or culled across 108 farms over 23 counties. 21,000 turkeys in Otter Tail County, 45,000 in Meeker County, 50,000 in Candy Yohai, 56,000 in Redwood, 67,000 in Stearns. Do I hear 76,000 in Stearns? Yes, 127,000 on a Hormel farm in western Wisconsin, 152,000 in Kandiyohi, whose outbreak has since expanded to 40 separate farms, 1 million plus hens in Nicollet County owned by Michael Foods, a division of Post Holdings, nearly 4 million hens in Aceta County in Iowa, just south of Worthington, 5.5 million birds at Rembrandt Enterprises in Buena Vista County, Iowa, owned by Star Tribune owner Glenn Taylor, and on and on, spilling over into turkeys in North and South Dakota, the chicken egg belt across northern Iowa, industrial turkeys and chickens in Wisconsin, and down the Mississippi to the concentrations of cargo poultry in Missouri and northwestern Arkansas. How do I explain this outbreak? Well, despite years developing contingency plans, many a university and governmental scientists here has expressed shock at the outbreak calling it unprecedented and throwing all the old dogma out the window. In some sense, I get it. Influenza is explosive and can reach a geographic scale that outpaces many a plan. Certainly the Chinese and Indonesians can speak to that. And yet we should be shocked that they're shocked. First, outbreaks have routinely wiped out industrial poultry around the world. And second, these outbreaks have been routinely reported on in both the popular press and scientific literature. True surprise would indicate incompetence. Feigned shock would indicate deception. So stymied scientists have moved to speculating rodents or small birds seeking food or flies track the virus into industrial barns. Or perhaps it's the wind bringing fomites bearing flu particles through the barn vents. That this may say something about the biosecurity of so-called biosecured farms is a notion that is sequestered off. That can't be, we can't talk about that. The industrial model comes first and everything, including nature and its pathogens, must cooperate with it. Perhaps it's the worker's fault. The virus may be entering on clothing or shoes of workers, although, quote, commercial operations have strict biosecurity guidelines for changing clothes and disinfecting items. And yet, with months for warning and all precautions taken, the outbreak marches on into the summer months and over a broader geographic extent. <coughs> well, we need then back up and blame the reservoir from which almost all reassortants emerge. Quote, bird flu has been found in more than 100 species of wild birds. The virus can be left behind in wild birds' feces on feathers on their bodies of dead birds. Birds confirmed to have carried the virus currently spreading infection in the United States include ducks, Canada, Canada geese, and predatory birds. Indeed, as one USDA official put it, when you look at a map, you see a lot of turkey farms in Minnesota. When you look at a map of Minnesota, you also see a lot of lakes. Ipso facto, there's your explanation. <laughs> now, there may be something in that gem of illusory correlation. Wetlands, under enormous pressure worldwide, have traditionally served as waterfowl migration stops. A growing literature shows many migratory birds have responded to the uh, destruction of their natural habitat. Geese, for example, display an alarming behavioral plasticity, adapting entirely new migratory patterns and nesting in new types of wintering grounds, moving from deteriorating wetlands to food-filled farms. In 2013, the Environmental Working Group issued a report showing precipitous declines in available wetlands across the prairie pothole region as these are drained and 
plowed for new agricultural land. The, EWH, the EWG map overlaps with many of the initial counties first hit by H5N2 across Minnesota and North Dakota. Now we needn't repeat the USDA stumble over correlation causality, but the overlay suggests a mechanism by which the interface between wild waterfowl and poultry have increased in the region, a shift for which agribusiness appears responsible on both ends. Now clearly, fomites and waterfowl are part of the story. But why the effort to dump the entire problem onto these marginal sources of causality? Minnesota is the country's largest turkey producer. According to the Minnesota Department of Agriculture, as of 2012, the state produced 47 million turkeys, 42 million chicken broilers, and 13 million layers, laying 3 billion chicken eggs. Its poultry sector accounts for $2 billion a year in sales. Upon announcement of the first outbreaks in Minnesota, 40 countries banned Minnesota turkey imports. There appears then a strong economic compulsion to protect the sector at all costs, including blaming everything other than the industrial model for the outbreak. Indeed, the state has a class character. It is organized around protecting many of its industrial sectors at all costs, including, or perhaps especially, ideologically. Surely, cooperation is needed to stop the outbreak. But the bipartisan nature of the government's response also speaks to the state's prime directives. The fate, and certainly the fortune, of the poultry sector reverberates down the hierarchy of state agencies and university research units responsible for responding to the outbreak, including, as we've said, blaming anyone and everyone other than the sector. And that extends to covering the actual dynamics of the outbreak in a blanket of secrecy. A 2005 state law addressing agribusiness concerns about privacy and the threat of animal rights activists exempts animal premises data from the open records law. The law is modeled after federal efforts provide, providing viruses in this age of an NSA off the leash more privacy than the humans the government ostensibly represents. The official blanket extends to photographs of the present outbreak. I have found several shots of piles of dead birds on site in Iowa, but not a single photo here in Minnesota. At best, it took, a star, it took the Star Tribune to photograph the perimeter of this barn on its own, a farm it still refused to name just up the Sauk River near Melrose. In my decade of studying bird flow, I have never seen such control exercised on coverage of an outbreak, including in China, whose post-SARS media regularly print photos of infected birds and their, and their disposal. So clearly, the pathogen is as much made in Minnesota as elsewhere, although off our last slide, this is a, a photo from Iowa. But what are the means and mechanisms by which avian influenza emerges out of industrial poultry and livestock? And how have shifts in global agroeconomics selected for novel strains? We begin with what's Consider the establishment model. Here's a global risk map of emergent zoonotics produced uh, by a number of luminaries in the field of echo health. It's based on a logistic <laughs> regression of presence absence of all newly emergent diseases since 1940 against such drivers as human population density and wildlife diversity. The warmer the color, the more likely new pathogen should emerge there. But in treating disease strictly in terms of ecological theory and confusing uh, absolute geography for causality, meaning if, if it's red, this is where the virus is going to come from. What the map misses is the uh, critical point that in some instances uh, would reverse our initial conclusions. So let's take H5N1, clearly emerged in southeastern Chinese province of Guangdong in 1996 before spilling over into Hong Kong. When we inc include what we've learned about the economic relationship Hong Kong and Guangdong share, causality shifts direction. By the 1990s, the relationship had returned to pre-revolutionary dynamics whereby Hong Kong acts as a proverbial front of the store, providing capital and marketing for Guangdong, the back of the store where production takes place. Indeed, at the time of H1, H5N1's emergence, four-fifths of the foreign direct investment through Hong Kong went to Guangdong, including backing the shifts in agriculture and land use implicated in disease emergence. 
Contrary to the morality tale that repeatedly characterized Hong Kong as some innocent victim, Hong Kong appears as responsible for Guangdong as Guangdong for H5N1, and causality moves in the other direction as well. So with these kinds of complications in mind, I started working with the University of Washington's Luke Bergman to test whether the world's circuits of capital as they relate to husbandry and, capital, uh, husbandry and land use are related to disease emergence. Here we have the percent of land whose harvests are consumed abroad as agricultural goods, there in green, or in manufactured goods and services in blue. In short, landscapes are globalized by circuits of capital. In this way, the source of disease may not be merely the countries in which new diseases first appear. It may extend as far as the other side of the world. We need to identify who funded the development and deforestation to begin with, as seen here in capital accumulation and consumption across croplands, pasturelands, and forests. It begs whether we might more accurately characterize such places as New York, London, and Hong Kong, key sources of capital, as disease hotspots in their own right. In short, thinking in terms exclusively of the virology or even the ecological thinking about uh, epidemiological uh, interventions is insufficient. You need a more of a relational geography relating different parts of the world. Also, need is moving out of our, our fantasies of, about the nature of even anthropogenic Earth. Earth has effectively been transformed into planet farm, with the attendant biomasses across from left to right for vertebrate wildlife, livestock in the middle, and people on the right. That's in millions of tons. And along with that is a uh, geographical distribution to show for it. Here are the total livestock per square kilometer, including all cattle, chicken, ducks, pigs, sheep, and goats as of 2006. We see an explosion in global intensification uh, in meat production. Here, the relative output to input for chicken, cattle, and pork. And it's driven by the global spread of vertically integrated filiere by which all the nodes of animal production are placed under one company's roof, from fertilization to freezer. Here we see the consolidation in US hog farms, with the number of farms precipitous, precipitously declining and the average heads per farm exploding. Fewer farms, more meat. The consolidation in physical space goes hand in hoof with that in ownership. In the US, five companies, Cargill, Smithfield, Tyson, JBS Swift, and Pilgrim's Pride, parlayed vertical integration and reversals and antitrust law into mass consolidation. They drove their smaller competitors under or took over their operations. According to the Institute for Agricultural agriculture and trade policy, I hear they're good people. Uh, the five companies now control 83% of beef production, 66% of pork production, and 58% of poultry production, some of the greatest monopolistic livestock <laughs> concentrations in the world. As a result, the U.S. has lost nearly 600,000 independent hog farms and half a million cattle ranches since 1980. The agroeconomic transition can be seen globally as well, with here annual global production in pigs more than doubling in 50 years and international exports in gray nearly tripling the past decade. So they're shipping pigs out. Um, and sometimes they ship them out by plane. So pigs do fly. And such changes are borne out in the ecologies of poultry and livestock, both inside and outside the barn. The profound shifts in stock breeding over the past three decades appear to have selected for new swine and avian influenzas, which now serve as a growing reservoir of potentially pandemic strains. Here, as of 2010, we have a list of only those highly pathogenic H5 and H7 that struck when no such strain was previously present. Those studies highlighted in blue document on-site shifts from low to high pathogenicity. All these, save one, occurred on large-scale operations of more than 10,000 poultry. 
Preliminary modeling, exploring the mechanism for the evolution of, of such virulence. Don't worry, it's not going to be on the test. Here's a model by a group headed by Yale's Alison Galvani showing increasing the rate poultry are harvested. A move at the center of industrial stock breeding could select for increased virulence in influenza. So in brief, the story goes that there's a cap on how much of a badass you can be as a virus. You can't kill too many of your, your hosts before you transmit into the next. If you do so, then your lineage dies out. So, but what happens when you know the next host is going to be there? That basically selects for strains that can get to the threshold in the host that they can spread to the next one. So the cap on virulence is removed, and this is what happens in a farm, a barn with thousands of genetically similar uh, poultry that are um, put in, stuffed in together. And that relationship uh, is related to the harvesting rate. So as the harvesting rate quickens, you go from 80 days, 60 days, to down to 40 days in which they're, they're harvesting the poultry, processing them. That puts pressure on the virus to get to its transmission threshold faster. Industrial poultry's role extends to transmission. It's a series of sero seroepidemiological studies of workers shows multiple influenza types widespread across the poultry supply chain. Wang's group, for instance, showed H9 across the commodity chain in China, especially among poultry market retailers and wholesalers, and workers in large-scale poultry breeding enterprises. The phylogenetic evidence is starting to roll in as well. For instance, in the skyline plot in the left, upper left there, Guan Yi's group shows that H5N1 underwent a population increase and an intended increase in diversity only when the virus entered populations of domestic poultry in China. At the genome level on the right, the series of reassortment events leading to virulence in which the virus switches geno genomic segments occurred only when H5N1 entered domestic populations. The diversity of influenza plays an important part in the way the virus is able to evolve new phenotypes. Here are the hemagglutinin and neuraminidase, that's the H and N in H5N2. These are collected from mallards at an important migratory stopover site from 2002 to 2010 in southeast Sweden. So the H's are on the upper left, and the uh, different types of neuraminidase are on the bottom left. So um, and these, these are all the different types that are found at one breeding site. So these are wild birds, and you can see the diversity in the influenza's waterfowl share over time. The thing is, is that the same can be said for industrial poultry and livestock. Back in 1982, virologist Kennedy Shortridge found 46 out of what were then 108 possible combinations of H and N in a single poultry factory in Hong Kong. So the so-called wild-type influenza diversity is now found on industrial sites. More recently, a consortium tracked the various H1 and H3 subtypes moving through Hong Kong swine, including classical swine influenza, European or Eurasian swine flu, the triple reassortant swine flu, H1N1 2009, Seasonal H1N1, H3N2, it's a veritable chicouterie of viruses. And we see an increasing richness in influenza spilling over into and supported by poultry there in the red. Different combinations of hemagglutinin and neuraminidase. And we see it now spilling over into humans as well. And it used to be H1s, H2s, and H3s. Now we're piling in on the H5s, the H6s, H7s, H9s. And that also goes for the neuraminidase as well. And that increasing reassortment is driven in part by the changing economics of the livestock sector. Remember the swine flu from 2009? Well, three of its genomic segments originated in the classical swine influenza. Three of its segments from a North American recombinant and two from a Eurasian recombinant. In short, every one of H1N1's genetic segments proved most closely related to those of influenza circulating among swine, together originating 
on wholly different continents. That's a geographic extent and commodity chain no smallholder operation can cover. Only internationally connected companies can pull that off. And unlike avian influenza, there are no wild pigs to blame. Consolidation in the sector, meanwhile, likely affects the evolution and spread of influenza influenzas in other ways. Nearly three quarters of the world's poultry breeding is in the hands of a few multinationals. The primary breeders who engineer the first three generations of broiler, la broiler lines commercial multipliers subsequently market declined from 11 companies in 1989 to four in 2006. The 10 companies producing layer lines in 1989, chickens that lay eggs, were consolidated to two companies by 2006 the Eric Vestjohan Group, and Hendrix Genetics. The value of the products these primary breeders provide is biologically locked by offering multiplier companies only the males of the male lines and females of the female line. As a result, batches of hybrid chickens, trade secrets, must be continuously purchased. By this industrial cascade, a single source male chicken can generate millions of broiler progeny largely bred for morphometric characteristics alone, fast growing, big breasts, etc. The practice, in effect, removes natural selection as a self-correcting and free ecological service. Any culling upon an outbreak or by farmers in reaction to an outbreak has no bearing on the development of immune resistance to the, to the pathogens it's confronted. As these birds, broilers and layers alike, are unable to evolve in response, in other words, the failure to accumulate natural resistance to circulating pathogens is built into the industrial model before a single outbreak occurs. On the other hand, while big poultry removes the means by which the birds can protect itself, influenzas may be adapting to the industrial model in some ingenious ways. Some preliminary modeling indicates that the virus may evolve a virulence, a deadliness, that's timed with the finishing time of poultry production when the barn of birds is, is processed. The virus wants to be able to infect enough in a barn to reach a threshold that permits it to infect the next barn. Incredibly, that would mean that flu's now something of a farmer too, husbanding cohorts of infected, not for market, the next, the next available barn of fresh susceptibles. Eh, so what? The sector shrugs its shoulders. Just a second here. Oops. Decades ago, Christopher, as Christopher Leonard uh, describes in his book, decades ago, agribusiness calculated that actual farming was a losing proposition. It represents a this economy of scale. You scale up and it costs you more. It's not a good thing. Because raising birds in huge monocultures of 50,000 turkeys or 250,000 chickens per barn is entirely too precarious. This is what the companies figured out real early. The birds too often get sick and die from infectious disease and stress morbidities. Agribusiness has long, know the, long known this and have restructured accordingly. Contrary to the prevalent notion, industrial poultry is not totally vertically integrated from, from the fertilizer to the freezer as I started. All the nodes are integrated save one, and that is growing out the birds. That's offloaded onto contract farmers who, at, who as employees, must take out millions in loans to buy the land, barns, equipment, and other inputs to raise the birds to company specifications. Imagine if you had to take out loans to go to your work. So the companies are using the contract farmers and their debt as trap crops by which to sop up the costs of such a dysfunctional production. In this case, the costs of the H5N2 outbreak. So despite all the hosannas about the poor workers and we need uh, to help them, 
that failure was built into the model decades ago. So they, they, that, this was their means by which they were, the company protects itself from outbreaks they knew their industrial model would produce. And that part of the epizoology is hard to see if land-grant universities, and here's the cargo building at the University of Minnesota, if land-grant universities trade in their charters for agribusiness R&D. Indeed, that myopic block, it's selected for in the researchers. It's, it's a design feature. As much as barns and silos, as Upton Sinclair puts it, it's difficult to get a man to understand something when his salary depends upon his not understanding it. Indeed, the short-term gains in agribusiness production and supply efficiencies have been developed only by way of a series of costs borne by local peoples and the environment, costs kept off company balance sheets. It's the research gaps we just touched on, but also occupational hazards, pollution, food poisoning, antibiotic resistance, price spikes, climate change, and monopolistic consolidation, declining nutri nutritional content, flooding, land bubbles, grain dumping, farm dispossession. Must I go on? Yes, yes. Forced migration and damage to transportation and health infrastructure are routinely externalized to governments, the indigenous, workers, consumers, taxpayers, livestock, wildlife. Somebody else always picks up the bill. Should these costs ever be internalized, put back on company balance sheets, agribusiness would end as we know it. So multinational agribusiness become and remain as large as they are by virtue of translating capital accumulation into political power by which to externalize the costs that they can afford. H5N2 and other outbreaks tell us such externalization introduces moral hazards of perhaps one day apocalyptic proportions. Why do they have to worry about an outbreak when they don't pay the costs? Of course, and that's a very deadly game that they're playing. So, what then to do? Clearly, breaking the Gordian knot here is a political program requiring the American people make the collective decision that agribusiness will no longer be allowed to run our states aground. That's a whole other and certainly necessary conversation. But even should a new political order be implemented, what do we do? Um, and this gets here a little squishier because we're not talking about what is, we're talking about what might be. And you know, that opens up all sorts of possibilities. But thinking about these possibilities is a, or that there could be possibilities is an excellent first step. And reviewing what's not working now is a good way of propulsing ourselves to thinking of other orders. My take is, first off, we need to make a move toward a regional planning that reintegrates our economy with our ecology. The ecology is the source of much of our wealth, and destroying it only impoverishes us. Even should we choose to continue intensive production, it must be integrated into the bigger picture of needs and expectations. Now here are the malt swale mounds built along natural water contours capturing rainwater for soil and, and controlling uh, against runoff. And they are perhaps emblematic of the kind of integrative thinking necessary for a system of agroecology acting at a bigger geographic scale. And that kind of thinking extends to dealing with pathogens. Other modeling I've been involved in shows complex agroecologies produce the kind of population stochasticity, kind of a, a chaos that keeps even fast growth pathogens from stringing together the susceptibles they need to produce an outbreak. So horrible as it is, Ebola in the deep forests of Central Africa takes out a few villages every 10 years. But as we saw this year, an Ebola given easy access out of the agroforest by monoculture palm oil and logging and mining makes it to local cities and then off the continent. And that's a whole order of other business. In that vein, we might here restore wetlands in an effort to wean the waterfowl off our farms, re reducing the interface shared with our poultry and livestock, 
however we decide to organize those. We need perhaps to diversify our poultry across our landscape ecologies as immune fire breaks. We should let them reproduce on site so that the immunological lessons they've learned by being infected can be passed on to next generations. We should treat natural selection as another ecosystemic service. It's available to us for free, well, except for a few inputs perhaps. We need perhaps diversify our farming practices so that the economy isn't beholden to a single sector. As that great ecologist, investment banker David Sanchi put it, too big to fail is too big to exist. The fates of ecologies and epidemiologies and all of us embedded within are fundamentally tied into such questions of ownership and economy. You know, forget GMOs and automated feeders. The mechanics of these kinds of interventions and whether they can satisfy goals in production and circulation are what make up the real cutting edge science of the 21st century. There's the rocket science. That's the hard stuff. Or even harder than rocket science. So you can learn more on my blog, Forming Pathogens. I posted there yesterday. I detailed the count of the H5N2 outbreak. And thank you very much. I appreciate it.